Animation. When you think of the word, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe a Disney or Ghibli movie, maybe Saturday morning cartoons or anime, or maybe you think of dystopian R-rated shorts that revolve around death and destruction. Animation is not just for kids. Despite what the award shows try to tell you by always associating it with princesses and Pixar, animation is not just an art form meant to keep children entertained. In fact, there is a show that brings horror to the forefront and in many different styles of animation. Love, Death, and Robots is adult animation at its finest. Each season is an anthology of shorts revolving around one or all the topics of, like the title suggests, love, death, and robots. Death seems to be the prevailing subject of most of the shorts. And since death is a morbid theme, many of these films turn to horror for their genre. Horror is perhaps the most adult of all the movie genres because it can lean heavily into violence, gore, and sexuality. The creators of the shorts are from a diverse set of countries and have different creative styles. So all of these shorts have unique interpretations of these themes. Because of that, we get various types of horror as well, from sci-fi epics set in space to stories in the jungle in medieval times. The scares also vary from physical to psychological. Many of these shorts are successful in telling their stories, and scary ones at that, definitely not suitable for children like the idea of animation might imply to some. The series currently consists of three seasons, with a total of 35 episodes. I've picked out a few of my personal favorites to talk about how they effectively use animation to create a unique horror experience, proving that animation is not just for fairy tales and talking woodland creatures. The series was created by Tim Miller, who you may know as the director of the first Deadpool movie, but he is no stranger to visual effects, animation, and short films. Initially, Love, Death, and Robots can be traced back to Miller and director David Fincher's undeveloped reboot to the 1981 film Heavy Metal. Long story short, it was never made into a film, but eventually Netflix agreed to release it as a series instead. The first one I'm highlighting is probably the most traditional of the shorts I'll be talking about in terms of storytelling. Bad Traveling is a masterclass of stunning animation with a well-crafted horror atmosphere. Released as part of season three from the US, it might be the most popular short so far, along with another I'll be mentioning later. It is directed by acclaimed director David Fincher, who is best known for his psychological thrillers like Seven, Panic Room, and Zodiac. The story focuses on a shark hunting ship and its crew, who have been attacked by a giant bloodthirsty crab monster. The crustacean makes its way onto the ship, and while one crew member, Torin, is sent down to kill it, the crab uses its abilities to communicate with him by controlling the vocal cords of a corpse. Torin makes a deal with the beast, who wants him to sail to Faden Island so he can feast on more unsuspecting humans. The rest of the short focuses on Torin and his decisions he must make as he tries to balance a team of sailors desperate for their own lives and the monster on deck, demanding more food as each day passes. Torin asks the crew to vote on what to do next, with the options being to either follow the demands of the crab in hopes some of the crew will be spared, or bring it to a farther but deserted island so no additional carnage will be done outside the ship. Two crew members vote to go to Faden Island, so Torin executes them and throws their bodies down to the crab so it can be satiated for the time being. The crew eventually turns on Torin and attempts to kill him in his sleep, but they fail as he was suspecting it. He kills them all, even one who said he refused the mutiny. Torin reveals that actually every crew member voted to go to Faden Island to try to spare their own lives, even though they knew the consequences that would have befallen the island's residents. At the end, Torin lights the ship's supply of shark oil on fire, seemingly killing the beast and his children and escaping on a lifeboat. Bad traveling is successfully frightening. It is right in line with Fincher's other dramatic work and effectively builds tension and dread throughout its 21 minute runtime. Its plot is succinct enough to work in short form, but filled with emotional and moral complexity as we follow Torin throughout this harrowing tale. The mental states of the crew members and our protagonist are key in this short as we watch how each sailor reacts to their situation. As death looms over the ship's crew, we feel the same anxiety and hopelessness that they do. As for the ending, it is brutal and satisfying. The animation is stylized, but still realistic enough for the violence to hit hard, and the crustacean to be terrifying as our main antagonist. It is certainly very violent when showing the kills, so that adds to the horror by evoking a visceral reaction from the audience. Bad Traveling is honestly more successful than the average full-length horror movie at being both scary and smart. Hibaro is another short from season 3, but this time from Spain. It tells an intoxicating tale about greed and brutality. It follows a group of Spanish conquistadors traveling through the jungles of Puerto Rico. One knight is deaf, made apparent by the muffled sound when the camera is focused on him and a fellow soldier talking to him in sign language. 
Soon after, the pack stops to seemingly take a break. The deaf knight approaches a nearby lake to pick up some gold he spotted in the water. This awakens a woman, covered in gold and adorned with many layers of jewelry. She dances and screams, the latter of which seems to have a siren-like effect on the soldiers and drives them insane, swinging their swords at each other and forcing them into the water to drown. All of them ultimately die, except for the Death Knight, who is immune to her call. He panically runs away, but later encounters the Siren again, deciding to meet her in the water. They kiss, making each other bleed as her teeth and lips are sharp, and he peels off her golden scales. The Knight suddenly knocks her unconscious, seemingly killing her, and tears away all of her gold and jewelry, collecting it for himself. He leaves with the treasure, while her body floats away and her blood mixes with the water, resulting in the healing of his hearing loss. The Siren eventually wakes up, screaming, when she realizes what's been done to her. And now that the knight can hear, he falls victim to her call and drowns in the lake, showing that hundreds of men have died because of the golden woman's song. Focusing on what can be boiled down to a toxic relationship, this story is emotional and haunting. We've seen sirens in media before, but I've never seen one like this. The knights lose all control and succumb to their inevitable demise. Even the deaf knight, who managed to escape initially, was lured back by his greed for the siren's gold. And this was a mistake with lethal consequences. This short is extremely keen in its directing, with the editing being manic and jarring to induce anxiety and show the intensity of the situation. The viewer is hardly given time to breathe as we are bombarded with intense movement, striking visuals, and sporadic music. Of course, the animation is immensely detailed, which adds to our immersion into the story. The beauty of the visuals, and even the dancing done by the siren and the entrance soldiers, wonderfully contrasts the savagery throughout the film. It is successful in being thought-provoking and showcasing a horror based on both love and death. Sucker of Souls is a season 1 short from France that's 2D animated, setting itself apart from the majority of films in Love, Death, and Robots that are 3D animated. Despite being 2D, Sucker of Souls is a fantasy story not lacking in brutal kills and gore. In the beginning, we are immediately thrown into the action, showing two men running from some sort of monster. It then cuts back to a few minutes before to show that they were on an Indiana Jones-like expedition with a mercenary, an archaeologist, and his intern, discovering a cave with ancient carvings in a another language. The intern transcribes, reading about a sucker of souls, but not long after that is attacked and viciously killed by a humanoid demon with sharp teeth and hands that can basically double as blades. The blood from his latest kill makes him stronger, and he becomes more creature-like in his pursuit of the other two. They are momentarily saved by a cat that walks by, revealing that the sucker of souls is frightened by cats. They meet up with the rest of their team, and the archaeologist figures out that the creature is indeed Dracula. With some well-timed explosions, they manage to kill it, but only to discover dozens more in a nearby cave. The short stops here, but I believe it is implied that they all die, even with the cat being there. Sucker of Souls tells a bit more of a classic horror story, one where the protagonists are investigating something they probably shouldn't be, and unsuspectingly get attacked by an ancient monster or spirit. This is a common horror trope, where the viewer might even say they had it coming because of course a cave like this is haunted or inhabited by someone like Dracula. There is humor throughout the film, but the violence and scares help balance it out. It is successful in telling a story and making us fear the villain Dracula, despite being more traditionally animated than the other films in this series. Beyond the Aquila Rift is the last one I wanted to talk about, because this is the one that has been stuck with me ever since I saw it back in 2019 in season 1. A short from France with breathtaking visuals and filled with existential dread. I found it memorable both for its amazing graphics and unique story. We follow a group of space travelers, including our main character Tom, as they make their return from a mission. Of course, something goes wrong as they go through a surge point gate that's supposed to transport spaceships, and they wake up off course apparently months later. A nearby by ship rescues them, and the captain is a familiar face to Tom, an old friend named Greta. They rekindle their past romantic relationship, but soon after, fellow crew member Susie notices Greta is acting strange and attacks her, cutting her on the neck. Tom sees later that Greta's cut has disappeared and confronts her about it. She confesses that he is still in hypersleep, and everything since he woke up has been a simulation. He demands to know the truth, and she shows him, revealing that he is trapped in a hellish and strangely organic alien ship drifting in space. Tom is emaciated, probably close to death, and sees that his crew members have already passed away. The creature behind all this is some sort of terrifying spider-like alien, which seems to be feeding off any ships and life forms that are unlike enough to be captured by him. Tom's fate has been sealed as death is inevitable and he is forced back into the simulation. Being trapped in a simulation is scary in itself, especially when the only true escape is death. 
the meaning of your life becomes pointless. Realizing that the true reality is a horrific monster and its hive feasting on your life force is terrifying. It also begs the question of how many other ships and innocent people this has happened to. It's depressing in many ways, a miserable, reoccurring nightmare that I still think about since watching it for the first time. What I love most about these shorts is that many of them manage to successfully world build and have a concise plot even though they are under 22 minutes long. Many films, definitely including horror movies, have convoluted plots that are complex for the sake of being complex, or they have a plot that is so simple that there are no surprises. Obviously, some of these shorts are better than others, but you can still appreciate the different art styles of each one. As we can see, animation is not just for kids, even if that is a stigma. Like any art form, it can change depending on the artist and the vision they have for their work, whether it be adult sitcoms, violent animes, or more specifically, hyper-realistic short films that cover all sorts of mature themes. These shorts from Love, Death, and Robots range in the types of horror they portray and tell new and terrifying stories. Nowadays, there are plenty of adult animated shows, ranging from Bojack Horseman to Invincible. In fact, a majority of animation meant for an older crowd tends to be 2D animated, aside from the recent hit Arcane. So that makes this anthology series even more special. I think it's important that animation is not belittled because of its association with cartoons. And trust me, I love cartoons and other 2D animation. You can tell a lot of time and energy has been put into each short, and not to mention money. I mean, those hyper-realistic renders of an entire alien hive don't come cheap. Big names are attached to some of these films, with award-winning writers and directors and actors like Rosario Dawson, Michael B. Jordan, and Seth Green. Shows like this help dramatic and even horror-themed adult animation gain more and more recognition among casual viewers. It is sad that for many, animation is thought of as a genre instead of a medium, and that it is meant for children. Love, Death, and Robots is an amazing addition to both the world of animation and the horror genre. Animation is for all ages, all genres, and horror is definitely no exception.